So I'm Peter Openshaw, I'm Professor of Experimental Medicine at Imperial College London and uh, President of the British Society for Immunology. So I guess I was a sickly child. Um, I, as a, when I was young, I, had, I was asthmatic and I had a lot of time off school and I thought respiratory viruses were really interesting. I guess once I qualified in medicine, I, was, I became really interested not only in the childhood origins of adult disease, but also in the inflammation that's caused by a lot of these infections, you know, how they actually cause lung damage. That was really what, what intrigued me initially. That's really difficult. I would say when I went into the field, people were just really measuring viral load and they thought that the amount of, of virus in the lungs was sort of proportional to the severity of disease. I think that still is true to some extent, but we didn't really appreciate the importance of the host immune response and the way in which that can contribute to disease as well. And a lot of disease really is is, a, is is driven by the host immune response rather than just being the virus itself and I think that's been the main change. I think the the focus on what's happening at the mucosa is really important so the further you go from this lining of the lung from the surface lining of the lung throughout into the tissues and then out into the periphery the more you lose information about what's really happening at the site of site of inflammation so tight focus on the mucosa and on the inflammation caused by viruses. I think that's been the main change I've seen over the last 30 years or so. Well, it ranges all the way from animal studies through to human experiments and I guess for me the exciting thing at the moment is the experiments we're doing on volunteers. So we're currently recruiting people who are otherwise healthy who don't mind being infected with common cold viruses and they are enormously generous in donating not only their time but also allowing us to take samples for example using a bronchoscope before infection at the height of common cold and during convalescence and I think that sort of information on real humans is, is to me a, a revelation. We've never had that level of information before and we're able to test new vaccines now uh, which are focused on the mucosa, on the mucosal site, trying to induce local immunity and that's very very exciting too. Well, <laughs> I, th I guess that speaking as a, a chest physician, somebody who deals with patients who have lung problems, I think trying to understand why it is that some people suffer so badly from colds and why some people end up in hospital with influenza, but other people have very mild infections that they just deal with at home or maybe don't even have any symptoms at all. Understanding that range of responses is a very important question scientifically. In terms of clinical impact, I think we will see a whole new range of antiviral drugs and vaccines which will come on to the market within the next few years and finding what their place is um, in clinical practice is going to be very interesting. Well I think generally collaboration is is the way we should go. I think science used to be a rather solitary pursuit, um, often done by men in their labs. Um, and I think the way that we need to go is to be much more interactive, collaborative, and to build teams with different expertise in order to address these major, major questions. And often you need to study you know, many aspects of the host, many aspects of the virus. You need to integrate all of that together in order to understand you know, what it is that creates that explosion of response that lands people in hospital. So it's that integrated approach um, which is intrinsically collaborative, intrinsically internationalist. Um, we can't do that just by, by hunkering down in your own lab. Well it's very different from working in a lab.
And for that reason, I found it very interesting to be on many of these advisory committees and to sit in Whitehall discussing with politicians, you know, how in, tr in fact we manage outbreaks. I think, you know, things I've learned have been that something which may be scientifically worthwhile may, for various reasons, not actually be possible. Um, and that's interesting. Um, I guess that it's, it is vital that we have that interface between science and policy and it's been one of the major things that we've done in many of the organisations in which I've been involved, including the BSI, but also things like the European Scientific Working Group on Influenza, ESWI, which has a really strong policy line and trying to translate all of the science into something which makes a difference in terms of policy planning and prevention is vital, I think. Yes, clearly. I think it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, if we think where is the next big outbreak going to come from, influenza seems the most likely thing which is going to mutate and spread. It, it is one of the best viruses in the world, I would say, in terms of its ability to spread from person to person and to cause explosive outbreaks. It's not to say that there aren't other viruses which could also do it, but, but I think respiratory transmission is clearly one of the, the best ways for an epidemic to develop um, and respiratory viruses are certainly not receding in importance. I would say that with increasing global population, with urbanisation, with increasing travel, with many people being cooped up in aeroplanes together, that's a great way of spreading viruses and I think the risk of, um, of, of an explosive transmission has, has never been greater really in throughout human history. I think clearly the seasonal influenza vaccine is a good vaccine, but it's not an excellent vaccine. You know, it doesn't it doesn't tick all the boxes. We'd like a vaccine that would work not just for this season, but for next year and the year after and the year after that. We'd like something which lasts at least five years, ideally ten, maybe more. But the virus mutates so fast, it's very hard to know where it's going to go next. We need new approaches to vaccination, new adjuvants but also new ways of focusing on immunity which is going to cover all strains of flu. That's a very tough, tough ask. I think the vaccines we've got at the moment are okay and they're certainly good business for the vaccine manufacturers because they have to be given so often. But I think, you know, as scientists, we need to constantly push for improvement. Well, I think there are many challenges. The thing which worries me most at the moment is our decision to leave the European Union. We know that for every five million that we as a, a nation put into European science funding, we get about eight, eight million back. And with the reduction in the spending power that we have because of the drop in the value of the pound, the ever-increasing budgets that we need to, to do really world-class science, the importance of EU funding in terms of creating collaborative networks, all of this is under threat and I think it's absolutely vital that we impress on the politicians and the decision makers that if we're going to encourage national prosperity and progress in, in health, we have to get it right. We have to make sure that we continue this collaboration and that the amount of money going into science isn't diminished.